Hey folks, happy Thanksgiving. Today, with multi-generational family meals in mind, we are sharing a conversation I had in April 2021 with Stanford professors Jennifer Ocker and Naomi Bagdanis about their book, Humor Seriously, Why Humor is a Secret Weapon in Business and Life. It's one of my absolute favorites, a thoughtful and I think funny guide to navigating the world on the precipice of a smile. Enjoy. LinkedIn presents. As far as our brains are concerned, laughter is like exercising, meditating, and having sex at the same time, but logistically easier. And <laughs> More appropriate in the office. That's right. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, why cultivating levity can make you healthy, wealthy, and more effective at work. For years now, really ever since I was a child, I've been haunted by the same question when I haven't had the courage to ask aloud. I've worried that if I got the wrong answer, the consequences could be disastrous. It would shatter my self-esteem like a Tootsie Pop under the heel of a shoe. So much of my self-esteem, the picture of myself I maintain as a father and a husband, as a colleague and a friend, one that I protect like a signed Elvis poster, is based upon a belief that might, in fact, turn out to be a sham. But a few nights ago, I decided I couldn't take it anymore. So I gathered my wife and kids around our kitchen table, hit record on a voice memo, and asked them to give it to me straight. So guys, here is my question for the family. Am I funny? Yeah, sure. (laughs) Not exactly the ringing endorsement I was hoping for. So I turned my attention to my youngest son, Rye. Surely he must remember the time I danced like Madonna in her prime in the middle of the airport food court, freezing whenever he hit the pause button on my AirPods. I knew he'd have my back. So I asked him to rate my sense of humor on a scale of one to five. One. One? One? Good gracious, okay. And here I thought Rye, our youngest, would admire my juvenile antics, but maybe that was my problem right there. Sure, Rye laughed at my pratfalls, but he's too young to appreciate the trained assassin precision of my more subtle witticisms. I needed the opinion of someone who appreciates my sophisticated repartee, and it just so happens I live with such a person, my almost perfect wife, Elisa. You are a three. On a scale from one to five, I'm a three in terms of funniness. Yeah, and how are you defining funny? Like, well, it could either be weird, funny weird, or it could be funny as in humorous. The question is, how are you defining Okay, funny? you're a 4.5 for weird. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a three for funny. There are only a few moments in life when a casual comment tossed like a candy wrapper can demolish your entire sense of self. Like when your high school basketball coach tells you he's never met someone so tall yet so uncoordinated. Or when your girlfriend mentions in passing that if your relationship has any chance of succeeding, you're going to have to shave the mustache. And then there's having your lovely wife and mother of your children confess matter-of-factly in a conversation she knows is being recorded that insofar as you are funny, it is unintentional at your expense. Listener, I need help. Lucky for me, and perhaps you, there's a brilliant new book out that's meant to treat this very ailment. It's called Humor Seriously. After years of research, the authors have concluded that using humor might be the single best way to accelerate your career, deepen your relationships with your friends, your family, and the world. And as it happens, you don't even have to be funny. Take Jennifer Ocker. She's one of the authors of Humor Seriously, and not only does she have the humorless title of General Atlantic Professor at Stanford Graduate School of Business, she was also once voted the least funny member of her family. I can relate. And then there's Naomi Bogdanis. Okay, she's actually pretty funny. She did sketch comedy and improv before joining Jennifer at Stanford, but she also spent years as a corporate consultant, sitting in boardrooms, acting all serious, hiding her funny under a high bun. Now, after years of studying humor and teaching a class about it at Stanford, they have concluded that the funny bone may be the most important bone in your body. And can I just say, 
that if they can get a bunch of GRE acing nose to the grindstone Stanford MBA students to see the value of a good laugh, then clearly they're onto something. And you know what the best part is? Anyone can do it, even the weird funny, because it turns out being funny isn't about cracking the best jokes. It's about approaching life with a spirit of levity. I love this. When we stop taking our work and our lives so damn seriously, we open ourselves up to more meaningful relationships, more fruitful collaborations, more joy, and more fart jokes. There's hope for me yet. I think I could have gotten a teeny bit funnier since reading the book Humor Seriously. Do you think that's possible? Have you noticed I've been a little bit funnier last week? I wouldn't week? mind you last infusing a little more levity into our marital disagreements. Ah, yes, I agree. That's a great time for humor. For humor and, and more levity. Levity indeed. All right. Well, let's check back on how funny you think I am in a week. <laughs> okay. Okay? Hey, you. I'm Andrew Seaman. Do you want a new job? Or do you want to move forward in your career? Well, you should listen to my weekly show called Get Hired with Andrew Seaman. We talk about it all. And it's waiting for you, yes you, wherever you get your podcasts. Ooh, big question. Caleb, should I be pushing record now on my voice recorder? You bet. <gasps> oh my gosh, I almost forgot that. That's okay, I forgot it too. <gasps> then I would have blamed you, so we're all fine. It's all fine. <laughs> I would have blamed Naomi, but that's <laughs> <laughs> I will take it. Jennifer and Naomi, it is so great to have you on the Next Big Idea podcast. I've been really looking forward to this. I just love your book. <gasps> Thank Go <you>. on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is. It, it, it's changed my week, and, I'm, and I, ha I have a hunch it's going to change my whole year and beyond. Wow. You know, sometimes you hear your book changed my life, but to hear that it changed your week is also pretty good. Was it a five-day week, Rufus, or a seven-day week? You know, it, it felt like a nine-day week. Uh, there were kids involved in the background. But, uh, but you know, I've only had, it's only had a week so far to change my life. I mean, had it, you know, if I'd read it a year ago, I think it would have changed my year. But, uh, you know, I, I love books that effectively deliver their philosophy through the title and subtitle. Your title, Humor Seriously, How Humor is a Secret Weapon in Business and Life. And then you may actually manage to have a sub-subtitle, asterisk, how anyone can harness it, even you. There's a clear public service message here that we need to take humor more seriously. It's true. And right now we're living in a time where mental health has been on the decline. Rates of depression and social isolation have been on the increase in substantial ways. Remember, this is a book about humor. Are you laughing yet? Um, <laughs> that's the way we like to start all of our interviews. <laughs> well, and you guys were attracted to this project for somewhat different reasons, weren't you? Absolutely. So, yeah, we came to it from completely different angles. For me, humor was always a really big part of my life in a way that was probably annoying for other people. I was voted class clown of my high school you know, my family growing up, any birthday or any occasion, you always wrote a song about that person. So we'd write a, you know, a custom song about my mom that was totally ridiculous and funny. And so it was really woven into the fabric of my life and my family. And then I went to work and I completely lost my sense of humor, or at least I lost my sense of humor while I was working. Um, I started leading a double life because I thought that as a young woman in business, I had to behave all of these ways to be successful. And that was serious and professional and never making a mistake and certainly never making a joke. And by the way, during this time, I was doing comedy on nights and weekends. So I was doing sketch comedy and improv comedy. It was a really, really big part of my life. I just totally hid that from my colleagues because I figured they're not going to think that there are any transferable skills there and consultants really care about transferable skills. Um, until one day, a client of mine basically told me that she had never seen me laugh and guessed that I was a sad cat lady on weekends who had no friends. And I had this realization that all of these things that made me happy and even successful outside of work were rooted in my sense of humor, were rooted in my, you know, personality. And so 
if I could bring more of that humor and personality to work, I wondered whether I could, first of all, avoid burnout, but second of all, actually be more successful at work too. So that's what set me on this journey. And Jennifer's path sort of started in the opposite way. Right. So just as background, I am a behavioral scientist. And so most of my work is focused on how meaning and purpose shape the choices individuals make. And for pretty much all of my life, I never really viewed humor as important for most of my career. Like it was inefficient. It was often silly. It took up too much time and it was maybe detrimental to what I was doing as a researcher. But then I saw it firsthand about eight years ago. I met this entrepreneur named Amit Gupta, and he was diagnosed with leukemia and he needed a bone marrow transplant and he couldn't find one in the National Marrow Donor Program, which is daunting, intimidating, and um, not funny at all. But what was incredible was how he approached this challenge. It was all with this mindset of levity. So For example, part of his difficulty finding a match was that there's not enough South Asians in the donor database. So Mm -hmm. he would have these bring your own South Asian swap parties. And he gathered comedians for PSAs um, asking people to give a spit about cancer um, so that they would give saliva samples for matching. So what was incredible while I was watching him do this is that even though he was facing a deadly serious illness, he made the world around him magnetic. And in, you know, sort of the 11, 12 weeks of working with him, along with his friends and his family and my students, he ended up finding a perfect match, saving his own life and the lives of others. And and what I noticed was that none of the humor he and his friends used detracted from the seriousness of the task at hand, because that seriousness was self-evident. But humor helped build energy and it drew others in. Like my students became friends with his friends and family like, immediately. And it mm. mobilized them. And so I went from being, you know, surprised at how he reacted to having leukemia to being shocked that we weren't all doing this. That is, I mean, the fact that that really a sense of humor in this case could save someone's life is extraordinary. And and another thing I find extraordinary, honestly, is that looking backwards, that you, Naomi, who had the side hustle as a stand-up comic, that it hadn't occurred to you until only a few years ago that this was so relevant to business. I mean, now, of course, it all seems so self-evident. Absolutely. And, you know, if you think about it in school, the class clown gets punished. Uh, You know, when you're too junior in your career and you're using humor, it can come off as frivolous and not taking your job seriously enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we really get conditioned out of our sense of humor. And this is also, it comes from a false perception that in order to accomplish serious things, you need to be serious all the time. And this is not at all true. You know, we know that humor helps us build trust, that it builds psychological safety. We know in many ways it actually buffers the stressors that stand in the way of accomplishing serious things, that it makes teams more resilient, it makes individuals bounce back more quickly from setbacks. And so this misperception that we hold, if we really dig into it, we see that humor at work is not a weakness. It's a complete superpower. And it's also completely under leverage. So the bar for humor at work is so incredibly low. Well, filling out your your quiz, I asked my almost perfect wife, how (laughs) funny am I on a scale of one to five? She gave me a three. Oh, no. I then asked my kids. One gave me a five. Thank you, Gray. The younger one gave me a one. So again, I'm averaging three. (laughs) Um, It was kind of disheartening. So my mission is to get to a four out of five in the next hour, or at least a 3.5. But Jennifer, I gather your family also suffers from a failure to fully appreciate your sense of humor. You were voted the least funny in the family, I think. Yes. And that's one of the biggest reasons to write a book on humor, because You can beat them, Rufus. You can beat them in the competition that is the humor hierarchy within the family. And we're on your team. So here's what I'll say. You started at three. You weren't unanimously voted the least funny person. So there's that. You're starting on a really good base. Um, Second, what you need to do is start understanding this is not about being funny. This is not about cracking jokes. This is not about trying to be funny, which is 
the worst. This is just about being human. That insight that it's not about a performative sense of humor, but it's about a mindset to me was was huge. And I think it's it's one of the elements of this book that's going to change so many people's outlooks. Uh, but I think this is a, a great segue to your first big idea, humor is a superpower. We are in the midst of a mental health crisis with rates of depression skyrocketing to unparalleled levels as a global pandemic and social isolation pile onto already stressful work conditions. None of this is funny. And yet, your company's greatest salve just might be humor. Seriously, humor has enormous benefits for mental well-being, for physical health, and even for your bottom line. Yet, most leaders are massively underinvested in humor as an asset. Investing in my organization's sense of humor? In this economy? Connor Demon Yaman is not most leaders. Connor is a serial entrepreneur, and he recently joined a large nonprofit called Merit America as their co CEO. His first all hand Zoom call with his organization was scheduled amidst a challenging time for the world and a particularly divisive time in the US. In this context, Connor wanted to acknowledge the hardship of the moment while signaling care and reassurance. So during the call, he was sharing his screen. And when it was time for someone else to speak, he pretended to leave his screen share on, accidentally. As everyone held their breath watching him, he went to Google and he typed in, things inspirational CEOs say during hard times. Everyone lost it. It was a beautiful moment of levity and signaling of vulnerability in a totally unexpected way. And it was intentional. It wasn't hard and it had a very real upside for Connor. When people use humor at work, and it doesn't even need to be good humor, it just has to be not inappropriate humor, the bar here is very low, they're 23% more respected. They're also seen as more competent and more confident. Employees who rate their leaders as having a sense of humor, any sense of humor, reported to be 15% more satisfied and engaged in their jobs. And they rate their leaders as 27% more motivating and admired. Now, if you're not into being motivating or admired or having engaged employees, there is still a role for humor in your cold, cold heart, because it also translates to more negotiating power. Studies have shown that adding a simple, mildly funny line to the end of a sales pitch, like, my final offer is X, and I'll throw in my pet frog, increases customers' willingness to pay by an average of 18%. Part of this is that shared laughter accelerates a feeling of closeness and trust. When pairs of strangers laugh together for five minutes before completing a self-disclosure exercise, their interactions are rated on average as 30% more intimate than the control condition. Even reminiscing about moments of shared laughter makes individuals report being 23% more satisfied in their relationships. All the while, research by Gallup shows that one of the greatest drivers of employee performance is having a close friend at work. So here's a tip. If you're trying to accomplish something important and concrete, don't write off humor as unimportant. Instead, ask yourself how you can use humor to better accomplish your goals and consider throwing in your pet frog. So one of my takeaways from this is that I really need to get a pet frog. An 18% increase in customers' willingness to pay is enormous. You know, frogs are not that difficult to catch. But seriously, the data in your book is nothing short of extraordinary. I mean, I have to think when you were doing this research, you must have been thinking like, oh my gosh, this just keeps coming, right? I mean, it's, you know, I think most people know that humor is good, that it lightens moods, makes people happy. But, you know, the fact that, that funny people are smarter, higher status, perceived to be better looking right? Live longer. So what, among all these data points, were you astonished by how much evidence there was of the sort of the power, transformative power of humor and and what really kind of stands out to you? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's exactly what you said. It's like humor is this magic pill um, for so many things and it's free. And so whether you're talking about mental health, physical health, you know, making more money. It's really quite remarkable how much humor and having a sense of humor can drive each of these things. It was shocking how large the effect sizes were and how broad the positive impact is. You know, but part of this is people still not using it. And one of the things we find is just that people stop smiling and laughing, especially when they start to 
enter the workforce. Mm, yeah. When you ask people, you know, did you smile or laugh yesterday? People say yes when they're 16, 18, 20, 22. And then all of a sudden around 23, they start saying no. And they don't say yes again until they retire, which Brutal. is horrifying. Brutal. Yes. For me, I think the realization was I have been such a fool because this whole time mm. outside of work, I was building up these comedy chops, right? I was doing improv. Mm -hmm. I was doing comedy. And I was bringing none of it to work. And so I still remember the first moment that I accidentally used humor at work. I was in my mid-20s. And uh, I was leading a workshop for a group of executives. And it was a really big deal for me. So I showed up. I was had my hair in a high bun. I was doing my best to act 10 years older than I was. Huh. So I'm standing at the front of the room, and during this session, I notice the most senior person in the room named Craig was really disengaged and skeptical the whole time. You know, fingers laced behind his head, chair leaned back. And there was one point in the presentation, I was about halfway through, and I was in the middle of, of explaining how to tailor your communication to different personality styles. Craig cut me off. And he said sarcastically, Naomi, can you cut to the part where you just teach me how to make my team do what I want them to do? Wow. And so the, the room stiffened. And without thinking, I shot back playfully. That's a great question, Craig. You're thinking of the workshop I run on mind control. That one is next week. So, you, you know, come on back for that one. <laughs> yeah. Right. First of all, this is not a good joke. It's totally lame, which uh, again, illustrates how low the bar is. I think it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> thank you. I, well, okay. You have to understand the context, which is that Inception had just been released. So mind control jokes were pretty hot at this time. Um, so, I, you know, I basically thought that I had torched my career. And in fact, the exact opposite happened. The room erupted in laughter and all eyes turned back to Craig, mm. who for the first time all day was smiling. And so he took his hands out from from behind his head, he smiled and he said, word for word, I respect you. You can continue. And you know, I said, all right, thank you. I was planning on it. And <laughs> what I noticed was almost immediately the energy shifted. For the rest of the session, Craig was engaged. He was respectful. Everyone in the room relaxed. And so it was this moment for me of realizing this in practice, right? We we dig into the research, we dig into the science, but to really experience that firsthand, that was the game-changing moment for me where I thought, oh my gosh, how do I get good at this? How do I really start incorporating this into my work life in a way that's more deliberate? Well, this brings me to this kind of broader philosophical question, which is what exactly is humor. Uh, I, I mean, we all, it's part of our lives. So we don't think about it. But but if you were coming, looking at it from, from the perspective of an alien, perhaps it would seem kind of odd what we do. And before you answer that question, I'd love to play you uh, a Jerry Seinfeld clip that's actually from your book. On my block, a lot of people uh, walk their dogs and I always see them walking along with their little poop bags, <laughs> which to me is just the lowest function of human life. If aliens are watching this through telescopes, they're gonna think the dogs are the leaders. <laughs> if you see two life forms, one of them's making a poop, the other one's carrying it for him. <laughs> Who would you assume is in charge? <laughs> I, I love that. I love it. And, and I think it's also true of children, by the way. Like who's wiping whose butt? Who's doing the cooking? <laughs> like these, <laughs> these kids, they train us like circus elephants. You know, they're totally in, in control. But. Yes. So what's happening there? It seems to be like there's maybe some kind of like laughing at the absurdity of our human predicament. Yeah. I mean, part of this is just about noticing what's true in the world and then calling that out. And in some cases, exaggerating it or creating contrast or a rule of three. And that's, that's what actually is happening that creates essentially laughter for others. So your question was, what is humor? And I think one of the things that Naomi and I found is that people often equate it with being funny, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it's not. It's basically being much more taking this mindset of levity and looking at the world in a way that has this lens of, you know, how might we laugh together? 
And one thing that I want to highlight here that Jennifer is mentioning is this mindset. Mm -hmm. Jerry Seinfeld is navigating the world looking for incongruities or Mm. oddities or something that is worth smiling about. Mm -hmm. And a distinction that we make with our students and in the book is the difference between levity and humor. So we talk about how levity is a mindset. It's sort of an inherent state of receptiveness to and seeking of joy. So if you navigate the world with your shoulders slouched versus your shoulders back, it's going to change how you feel and how you act. It's also going to change how people act towards you. Similarly, if you're navigating your life on the precipice of a smile, looking for reasons to be delighted rather than disappointed, it's going to impact how you perceive the world and also how other people perceive and interact with you. So Jerry Seinfeld, instead of seeing a person picking up their dog's poop and saying, oh gosh, what a chore, he's looking at it and saying, well, how funny is that actually? You know, we think that we are our dog's owners and yet look at what's actually happening here. And that's what comedians are really good at doing. And then of course, humor channels levity. It channels that mindset towards a specific goal, right? So you, there are moves that you can make to turn that idea into humor. And I, I love that observation so much because I think, as you all point out, so many people see this as, oh, you know, humor is is a gift that you're born with or you're not. I mean, I think an alternative title for your book, somehow whenever I read books, I'm always thinking of all the all the possible titles. And although I <laughs> love your title, your title's fantastic. But, you know, would have been The Levity Mindset the case Mm -hmm. for living your life on the precipice of a smile. Um, But I think people can can sort of debate semantically or psychologically what humor is. But neurochemically, you all describe what's happening in your brain when you laugh, right? You say say effectively, there's a cocktail of hormones that's making us happier, more trusting, more euphoric. What's happening? Yeah, it's this incredible cocktail of, of hormones that we experience. So when you laugh together with someone, you release these endorphins. So that gives you something like a runner's high. And then we also have a lowering of cortisol. So you feel calmer and less stressed. And then you also release oxytocin, which is called the you know, trust or love hormone uh, released during certain kinds of physical touch. So in essence, as far as our brains are concerned, laughter is like exercising, meditating, and having sex at the same time, but logistically easier. And <laughs> More appropriate in the office. That's yeah. right. HR is not going to come after you. And these shifts in our brain impact not just how we see ourselves, but also you know, how we behave and how others see us and how they behave as well. So when you, when you all crack a funny... You're handing me this gorgeous neurochemical cocktail, and I totally want that cocktail, right? <laughs> because it's, it has an umbrella in it. It's colorful. It's, and it instantly changes my brain chemistry. It's- there's no calories. There's just upside. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Also, make a funny. I love that. I think that's really the third potential title for yes. our book is how to make a funny <laughs> right. the brain cocktail. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. There, you know, there's almost a, a, like a a flatulence joke in there somewhere, but it's a... Um. <laughs> There's always a flatulence joke, Rufus. <laughs> and now we know why you're rated an average a three in your <laughs> <laughs> It's time for a quick break, but don't worry. We'll be serving up another round of neurochemical cocktails as soon as we come back. If you're interested in the story behind the business headlines, check out Big Technology Podcast, my weekly show that features in-depth interviews with CEOs, researchers, and reformers in business and technology. Hi, I'm Alex Kantrowitz. I'm a longtime journalist, CNBC contributor, and the host of the show. I empty my Rolodex every Wednesday to bring you awesome episodes. So go check out Big Technology Podcast. It's available on all podcast apps. I'd love to have you as a listener. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. 
Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z General Partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. You know, you know, something I find fascinating is talking without any training whatsoever recklessly about human evolution. You know, it, it's, one has to assume that collective laughter in a group setting is something that is a primal human dynamic that has existed for a very, very long time. One of my favorite episodes we've done was a conversation with Christopher Ryan, who wrote a book called Civilized to Death about what we can learn from our hunter-gatherer ancestors. And he talked about the Paraha, a tribe in the upper Amazon, where um, a linguist named Daniel Everett lived for 20 years. And he writes, the Paraha laugh about everything. When someone's hut blows over in a rainstorm, the occupants laugh more loudly than anyone. They laugh when they catch a lot of fish. They laugh when they catch no fish. They laugh when they're full. They laugh when they're hungry, <laughs> right? And doesn't that sound wonderful? I remember thinking like, <laughs> I want to be in that tribe. I want to go and spend some time with these folks. And it begs the question, what are the dynamics that make that kind of easy, flowing laughter and group conviviality possible? And it seems like clearly these folks are living in a kind of bubble bath of trust with a group of other people. Mm -hmm. But you think this, don't you think there's something kind of uh, uh, deep and primal about the, the role this plays? I love that. So, I mean, there have been so many different theories around why we laugh and why we have humor. Um, superiority theory, that our laughter expresses feelings of superiority. This doesn't seem relevant in this culture. Um, relief theory. So, yep. you know, laughter is sort of part of the nervous system. It's sort of a pressure release valve. So that might mm -hmm. be when we don't catch mm -hmm. any fish. Um, some relief. And then incongruity, so the perception of something incongruous. Um, this is the Jerry Seinfeld laughing at when he sees a, you know, an owner picking up after the dog's poop. If we zoom out from that, humor is a fundamental melody of human conversation. It is a language we all speak. It gets us on the same page. It's, you know, it's so easy to chime in. And we know that, by the way, it has high um, social contagion. So how do we create these cultures? Well, we have looked more at how we create these cultures in professional mm -hmm. environments. Mm -hmm. But of course, we've also looked at how do you create these cultures in other environments. And one of the tips that we have around this is based on a foundational tenet of improv comedy. And that's the concept of yes and. So Tina Fey talks a lot about this in her book, Bossy Pants. And I love the examples she gives. So she says, if you start a scene with, I can't believe it's so hot in here, and then the other person says, well, no, it isn't, then you're kind of at a standstill. Mm -hmm. But if instead she says, let's say she says, I can't believe it's so hot in here. And Rufus, you say, well, what did you expect? We're in hell. Or you say, um, yeah, you know, this can't be good for the wax figures. Then the two of you are really getting somewhere. And so what we teach our students is similarly in our lives, we're presented daily with these small gestures from our coworkers and our friends demonstrating that we're open to humor and play and we call these offers. Mm -hmm. So oh, one of the sim yeah and so one of the simplest and most powerful things that we can do to create a culture of levity is notice these offers, look out for them and when we find them, yes and them. So I I'll give a really basic example from my inbox yesterday. So I'm on this email thread with a couple of people who will call Rose and Vivek because those are their names. I, I couldn't come up with fake names, uh, but maybe I should have. All right. So, <laughs> too late. So too Vivek late. And I, yeah, too late. Sorry, you're, you're out in the open. So Vivek and I, we both led workshops for Rose, but in the invoicing, my team had made a mistake and they invoiced uh, Vivek rather than Rose. This was obviously wrong. Vivek should for sure not be paying me. So Vivek, tactfully replied, uh, you know, just to clarify, I, I think Rose should be paying for this and not me. You know, it was kind of this awkward moment. Sure. And so I replied right away. I said, yeah, that's right. Sorry for the confusion. We'll send over a revised invoice. And then I added an offer just to see if Vivek would notice. I said, Vivek, um, I should still charge you for my grocery and utility bills this month though, right? So 
this is an offer, right? It's clearly a joke. I accidentally charged him a bunch of money that I shouldn't have. And I'm now saying, by the way, I should still charge you for my grocery and utility bills. Now, thinking back to that Tina Fey example, he could have replied, no, you shouldn't, right? And shut down that offer. Or he could have said, you know, haha, yeah, you should, which is the equivalent of saying yes. But instead, he completely yes anded it. So he replied, hey, Naomi, it's already taken care of. I paid you in Dogecoin. And so then it creates this total culture of levity between us, right? So these offers are tiny invitations for a teammate to bring out their own sense of humor. And the way that we respond to them is really important. When you have a culture where you are constantly replying to those offers with yes and, you get um, environments where joy comes more easily. And that's probably what was happening in that culture that you were mentioning as well. I love that. I love that. It's like, it, it's a dance, isn't it? You know, I, I was I was particularly surprised by the studies showing that in addition to everything else, humor can improve our ability to learn and remember things. That I did not see coming. Um, can you tell us about that? Yes. So when we laugh, we get a dopamine hit in our brains and that helps us or that, first of all, it's like a, you know, essentially a pleasure hit. And so we're more likely to funnel things to our short and long-term memory when that happens. So we know, for example, that when people laugh before taking a short-term memory um, challenge, that they will retain more than twice the amount of information than those who don't laugh ahead of time. There are also studies around students whose professors use humor in their teaching, and those students later retain more information. They do better on tests. That's amazing. I mean, a, f- a 50% increase in retention. I think back on all the boring classes I sat through, and it's clearly like a huge opportunity. Um, you know, to the extent that humor is a superpower, I think it's worth noting that the superpower can be used for good or for ill, right? I mean, as a, uh, yeah. it, it can be weaponized. And, and I think, and particularly among children, right? I mean, humor can sometimes be really cruel. And having been a teenage boy... I'm, I'm a recovered, <laughs> a, a fully recovered at this point, teenage boy. I remember the cruelty of humor every bit as much as I remember the joy of it. Yeah, well, first of all, um, once you tease someone and there is a cruelty to it, it can not only be scarring, you know, to that individual, but to you too. We always ask our students, to what degree do they remember, you know, the time they stopped being funny? And more often than not, it was when they used humor and it hurt someone's feelings, mm, and they basically stopped using humor ever since then. So it's, yeah, it's incredibly important to think about, you know, how do you, A, not just, you know, help people, including your kids, understand what is having a sense of humor versus being funny, and then B, what are some of the risks associated with it um, so that hopefully they have a greater awareness of where they might offend or alienate or hurt someone's feelings. And one of the best ways we found that help, you know, kids and, and people, because, you know, kids are people too, uh, is just, just to better understand their humor styles and what are the risks associated with each of these styles. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, could you share with us the, the different humor styles? Yeah, so there's these four humor styles. Naomi and I, over the course of about seven or so years, have run countless studies just asking people, you know, what makes them laugh and what did they believe is funny, et cetera. And we found that there's these four humor styles. The first is stand-up. So stand-ups tend to be bold and irreverent. They are not afraid to ruffle a few feathers to get a laugh. Oftentimes when they tease you, it's because they like you. But you can imagine there's significant risks with that stand-up humor style. Then there's the sweetheart, and they're earnest and understated, and they use humor that lightens the mood. So you might think of Wanda Sykes and Amy Schumer as a classic stand-up, but more like James Corden or Bowen Yang or Jimmy Kimmel as a classic sweetheart. Mm -hmm. Then you have the sniper, and they are edgy and sarcastic, and they're masters of the unexpected dig. So there's, you know, Michelle Wolf or Bill Burr, even Joan Rivers or Don Rickles would be classic snipers. And then you have magnets and they're expressive and charismatic and easy to make laugh, very generous with their laughter. So think Jimmy Fallon, Ellen DeGeneres, Mm -hmm. maybe Conan O'Brien. And so what we find is that all four of these different styles, 
which you can get data to tell you which one you are. And would be super curious to see if you took the quiz, Rufus. I did. Uh, at I did. Of course I did. Okay. So before we go into the risks and how you might alienate or hurt others' feelings oh. with some of these styles, can you share with us what you are? Yes. I'm, I'm an aspiring magnet. <laughs> oh, all right. I, mean, I, I tested on, on, the, on the quiz. I tested the highest as a magnet. Uh, I would say I'm a magnet that's getting a three out of five. <laughs> but yeah. That's that's amazing. Well, I would say we've heard from each of the styles that they think their type is the best. So snipers <laughs> think that their type is sort of the hardest to access and, you know, they don't give away their laughs generously and they're the best. And then we hear magnets that are like, oh, well, you know, I'm a magnet, but obviously that's the one that everyone wants to be. Well, but I, but I love your observation that actually most of us can cycle through these different modalities. And I've in the, in the kind of confession department, I recognize in myself that I had in certain moments in my life, maybe in my 20s or maybe maybe even more recently than that, if, <laughs> if I admitted it, that, that when you had some friends who were, you know, just wildly successful or you had a little bit of resentment for some reason, I found myself engaging in slightly snipery humor um, that I later self-diagnosed as having been a sort of an ego trimming maneuver. Like, mm, oh, I think this yeah. person needs to be brought down a notch or two. Yeah. And it has a lot to do with status too, yes, right? Because yes. the sniper humor that Naomi was talking about with the Craig story was so you know well done, partly because she did have lower levels of status. Um, in that context. I like how you right. point out higher levels of, of stature. I'm I, I'm a freakishly tall six foot three. <laughs> 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 what I've used to bring myself down a couple notches is bad posture. But I think I think humor <laughs> might be the better, uh, the, the healthier approach here. Um, yeah, I think humor long term might be might be better for you. And there there are a couple of other quick things here that you bring yeah. up, Rufus. One is around self awareness. Mm. The first principle of humor is at the heart of humor is truth. And so what we do with our students is we have them strip away the humor from whatever joke they've made. And we say, what is true for you? What's really true for you here? And is that truth something that you actually want to put forth in this moment? So in your example of actually being a little bit self-conscious and taking your friend down a notch, you know, to basically it was, it was about you and something that was true for you in that moment. If you do that exercise, you can it's actually a self-awareness exercise mm -hmm, too mm -hmm. of what's going on for me. What am I trying to surface through this truth? And then the other thing is you bring up a great point, which is that we not only can shift our style, but we should mm -hmm. in different contexts. So, you know, Jennifer referenced that moment of me with Craig, and that was definitely sniper style humor. I was a relatively lower, low status person in the mm -hmm. room and I was using humor and doing what comedians call punching up. Mm -hmm. Now shift that context, and I'm now teaching in the classroom at Stanford Business School. I'm now in an authority role. And I remember in my second day of class, I used sniper-style humor with one of my mm -hmm. students. And it just it felt like I had kicked the student's puppy in front of everyone. And I had this realization, oh my gosh, that's right. I need to be leaning on magnet and sweetheart style humor because now I'm now I'm, I'm the authority. Now I'm the highest status person in the room. And so this is recognizing that our sense of humor isn't just one mm -hmm. thing. It's not mm -hmm. something that you, you know, throw into your backpack and show up at work and now you have your sense of humor. It's far more nuanced than that. And especially if we want to use it to to specific goals, whether it's to build bonds or to take someone down a notch or to, you know, increase creativity in your team, there are different modes of humor. There are different styles that are going to work best to achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think, and I think as a, you know, six foot three white guy who's been running, you know, small businesses for 25 years, most of the punching in most of the environments I'm in is, is lateral or down, <laughs> which doesn't feel right. Right. So that, I think it's like, I'm, right. I, I mean, maybe partly people hopefully adapt to their environment, you know? Um, <laughs> right. 
both psychologically and physically, it must be hard for you to punch down when you're that exactly, that, that, exactly right. I know, I know. This, Sorry. The, the bad posture joking. helps a little bit. I, I, it brings me down <laughs> right. couple, a couple inches. Yeah, I, yeah, that's good. I, 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 I last <laughs> stood up straight in 1986, I think. Um, <laughs> you're at a 4.5. Uh, I, I, think, think, I think you're at a 4.5. Maybe 4. Five. I'm, go, I'm shooting for 4. I'm gunning right. for 4. Humility, humility. Um, so this <laughs> is a perfect segue, I think, to big idea number two. Humor can be learned. We have all fallen off a humor cliff. Clearly, humor is powerful. The problem is, we've lost our sense of humor. Over a million people in 166 countries were asked a really simple question. Did you smile or laugh yesterday? For those who are 16, 18, 20, the answer largely is yes. Then, around age 23, the answer becomes no, and we don't start laughing again until we retire. Put another way, the average four-year-old laughs 300 times a day. It takes the average 40-year-old two and a half months to laugh that many times. So how do we climb back up the humor cliff? Here's a tip. Use techniques from comedians. First, observe. Humor isn't about inventing the perfect one-liner from thin air, but it's about noticing what's true in your life. At the end of each day, write down five observations from the day. Simple things like how excited your dog is at dinner time, or how you take a walk around the block every afternoon to break up the day, or how you actually took a work call today in your underwear. Really simple observations. Then try using the rule of three by creating a simple list where the last item is a bit unexpected, like this. I miss so many things about office life, going for spontaneous coffee chats, getting supportive eye contact from colleagues, and wearing pants. Try exaggerating the third thing even further, like this. By far the most thrilling part of my day is when I get dressed to the nines, leave my house, and circle the block just to feel something. In the book, we share dozens of tips like this and examples from comedians that make humor feel easier, more natural, and of course, funnier. Well, like one of your good students, I sharpened my pencil and I, and I did as instructed. I wrote down things that were true <laughs> in the course of the last week. I told you I had a great week, right? Love that. <laughs> and one of the things I noticed is that I start every day as a really virtuous person. And I end the day, I gradually slide into more and more objectionable behavior. Um, so for instance, I wake up every morning. And I run a few miles while listening to your audiobook and podcasts and stuff. Nice, um, nice. The most virtuous thing one can do. If I see any old ladies, I help them across the street. I pick up litter. I <laughs> wave to neighbors. Very Truman Show. I come home. I smother my kids with hugs and kisses. I make them breakfast. Uh, I then lock in three hours of deep focused work, only interrupted by the consumption of 12 ounces of organic celery juice. I, I'm intermittent <laughs> fasting. I don't eat anything until lunch. Then I have a healthy lunch like a salad. Then things start coming off the rails. I take some calls. I get distracted by the internet. I start yelling at my kids. And then I start thinking about a glass of wine. I try to work. I end up pouring a glass of wine. Think about making dinner, pull up Grubhub, order dinner, look at the bottle of bourbon, try not to drink the bourbon, pour a glass of bourbon, (laughs) think about reading a book while turning on the television set. Like literally, I have the remote (laughs) control in my hand and I'm looking at the book and I'm turning on the television set. So my day ends and I'm watching trashy TV, drinking bourbon, trolling the internet, snapping at my (laughs) wife and kids. And then I do it again. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Can I just say that that was a beautiful display of you implementing so many techniques from chapter three of the book. So first, beautiful job making those observations. Thank you. And I want to make a couple of observations on what you were doing. Great, great. Okay, so first of all, your premise is contrast, right? What you looked for, the way that you sparked this idea, it sounds like, was recognizing that your day starts in a very different way than your day ends, True. Yeah. right? Okay, so then you had some exaggeration where you were going through your morning, and maybe every morning you don't help an old lady cross the street, but you were sort of exaggerating just how good you were in that morning, you right? You see through me, Naomi. I did, I actually have not helped an old lady cross the street in a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then we dove into some beautiful specifics because we know yes, that comedy right. 
uh, does what does better with specifics. So you talked about your 12 ounces of organic celery yeah. juice and intermittent fasting, right? You could have just said, uh, then I eat a really healthy lunch and moved on. But humor lies in those very specifics about your experience. Um, so that's another technique, specifics. Then you built out the world, right? So you showed us the entire day. Um, and probably these are not things that you're doing every single day, but you use the technique that comedians often use, which is to ask, if this is true, then what else is true, mm, yeah. right? So if I'm um, drinking bourbon, what else am I doing? I'm watching trashy TV. What else am I doing? I'm trolling the internet, right? So you sort of, you start to um, build out in this world where I am a horrible person at the end of the yes. day, what else am I doing? Okay, so that's called build out yes. the world. And then you also used rule of three. Um, by the way, rule of three, it it doesn't always have to be three uh -huh. elements. All it has to be is a particularly interesting or funny one that you end on. And so you said, I end drinking bourbon, watching trashy TV, trolling the internet, and you said something like being horrible to my wife and kids, right? Which is a direct contrast to the morning when you smother your family with hugs and kisses. And so it was such a satisfying end too, because you created contrast between your morning self and your end of day self using rule of three and contrast. Boom. Well done. <laughs> that was a 4.75. Well, clearly I need therapy and some intervention, but on the humor front, thank you for the four or five. <laughs> <laughs> and I only snap at my wife and kids on alternate days. I don't do it every day. Um, <laughs> Well, actually, we have. So I love the building out the world approach. I was inspired by that. And I think we have a clip that comes from your book that I love, Ellen DeGeneres. So it's been 15 years since I've done stand up. And when I decided to do this special, uh, a friend of mine was at my house and I told him I'm going to do stand up again. And he said, Really? And I said, <laughs> Yeah, I was hoping for more of a really, but it was <laughs> really. And I said, Yes, why? And he said, Well, do you think you're still relatable? <laughs> I said, yes, I do think I'm still relatable. I'm a human being. And he said, well, I mean, your life has changed so much. And I said, I, I know, but I still think I'm relatable. And anyway, just then, Batu, my butler, stepped into the library. <laughs> and he announced that my breakfast was ready. And I, I said, we'll continue this conversation another time. This is... Ridiculous. And uh, so I'm sitting in the solarium eating my breakfast and I was on my third or fourth bite of cube pineapple that Batu was feeding me. And I said, Batu, I'm not hungry. I've lost my appetite. My friend has really upset me by what he said. And um, he said, well, then I shall draw you a bath, ma'am. And I said, you don't have to announce it all the time. Just draw the bath. So I'm sitting in the tub and I'm looking out the window at the rose garden and Tatiana was tending to the roses and I knocked, ma'am. And um, anyway, I get out of the tub and uh, Batu had forgotten to put the towel next to the tub again. And um, so I had to do that bath mat scoot all the way across the bathroom to get to the towel. And you, it's a big, you can imagine how big the bathroom is. It's like <laughs> doing the bath mat scoot. And then I stopped and I was like, oh my God, this is relatable. <laughs> this is going to be you guys after the runaway success of your book. Are you ready for this? <laughs> yes, with bathroom scoots. I mean, but to see what she did there, she just built out this whole world, starting with Batu, the butler, and Tatiana, and her impatience with like, get on with it. And so it's just taking that exaggeration around that notion of relatability. And as Naomi said, building out that world. And then that joint laughter, where we all can kind of see the two different levels of that new world that she's building out becomes that thing that glues us all together. It's so good. It's so good. Well, I think we have at least one other clip at the ready, uh, which I think is an example of the use of analogies, which is one of your categories. Uh, we have a clip here from Jim Gaffigan. Big families are like waterbed stores. They used to be everywhere, and now they're just weird. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, analogy is definitely a more challenging form, but some people are so 
good at it. And it's incredible how easy it is to create humor from analogy. So we were talking to Michael Lewis, the author, yesterday, and he was talking about how well, actually, it was in a conversation around how do we st- how do we connect meaningfully with people in a time when all of our communications are happening over text and email? And Michael laughed and he said, you're asking the wrong person about texting. He goes, you got to understand, my children gather to watch me text because it's like watching someone shoot an underhand free throw. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is going to be funny. He's just making an observation. But by creating analogy and attaching it to that observation, it makes clear what the ridiculous thing is, and we're able to sort of laugh at the absurdity of it. When we come back, Jennifer and Naomi say that humor is like that college semester you spent in Spain, bold, authentic, and grammatically incorrect. See what I did there? I used the rule of three and an analogy. Anyway, stick around for more jokes after the break. Welcome back to the show. So we know that humor can help you accomplish your professional goals, especially if you throw in a pet frog. And we also learned some tricks of the trade that can help you navigate the world on the precipice of a smile. Now in their third big idea, Jennifer and Naomi say that humor can unlock love. Humor mitigates life's greatest regrets. Humor isn't just a way for us to be more effective leaders and more joyful people, but it's a way for us to lead lives of greater meaning. Research studies conducted by hospice workers have revealed surprising consistency about what people wish for in their final days of life, the regrets that they have when they look back on how they've spent their time. From this work, five themes emerged, boldness, authenticity, presence, joy, and love. Now, here's the big secret. Humor mitigates all five of these regrets. Boldness, I wish I had been less fearful of change and lived more boldly. Humor moves us through negative emotions more quickly. It diffuses tension, thereby allowing us to take bigger and bolder risks. Authenticity. I wish I had had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life that others expected. Humor empowers us to share parts of ourselves that are unconventional and authentic. When we're finding joy, we care less about what people think and we do more of what we believe. Presence. I wish I had appreciated the moment more and simply savored my time. Humor requires you to be fully present, to listen hard and search for observations in each moment. We are wired to anchor too much on our past or our future. Humor reminds us, viscerally, that each day as it unfolds is our life. Joy. I wish I hadn't taken myself so seriously, that I had let myself be more joyful. When you navigate your life on the precipice of a smile, you'll be surprised how many things push you over the edge how many places joy can be found or created. And lastly, love. I wish I had the chance to say I love you one more time. There are few acts as easy and generous as sharing a laugh with someone. When laughter cuts through tension and divisiveness to forge connection, humor enables love. Where there's humor, love isn't far behind. A final tip, create small moments of joy each day. And if you're having trouble finding joy in your own life right now, Look to create a small spark of joy for someone else. If you do, you'll not just have more laughter in your life, but more boldness, authenticity, presence, and love. And you'll give other people the courage to do the same. The leaders who do these things will create healthier, more productive, and joyful places to work. And the individuals who do will cultivate more meaning in their lives. So their lives will be lived with fewer regrets. You say humor isn't just a way for us to be more effective leaders and more joyful people, but it's a way for us to lead lives of greater meaning. Before we get to the greater meaning point though, let's talk about the being effective part for a second. Among the astonishing statistics in your book, you say 58% of employees trust a complete stranger more than their own boss, 58%. Not you, I am sure that you are exceptional, (laughs) but in general. That is true. Yeah, uh, uh, one, one, hopes, one hopes to be in the 42%, no, no question about right. it. You point out that one of the reasons this lack of trust exists is that what we expect of our leaders has evolved. Yeah, I mean, it used to be that leaders needed to be revered, mm. and now they really need to be understood. 
um, you know, authenticity is an overused word, but this idea of what do you really believe in? What's really important to you? What values do you really hold? How aligned are your actions and your words? Um, and do I trust you? You know, 45% of employees in one large scale study cited that lack of trust in leadership is the single biggest issue impacting their performance at work. And yet there's a wealth of research that links high trust organizations to innovation and performance. And so what we find is that when these new types of leaders, these leaders that don't take themselves so seriously, that do prioritize not just meaning and purpose, but really humor, they are able to make a dent in in this data. And so humor has these enormous benefits for cultivating trust. In fact, there's a 2019 survey that asked employees what characteristics do inspire trust in a leader. And the top responses are things like, you know, knowing the obstacles the leader overcame to be successful, which makes them more Mm. authentic and relatable and speaks like a regular person. So it's just this idea of being more human. Um, I think employees now yearn for these leaders who are less mysteriously brilliant and more authentically relatable. Well, I, I for one, feel some nostalgia for the days when leaders were revered and mysterious. <laughs> but no. um, I, Why is no one revered? Yeah, what, what happened to the reverence? The reverence was great. I mean, um, <laughs> well, I, I, I like how you take on directly the issue of inappropriate humor. And this is obviously important to be aware of. The, the, the first real company I co-founded in the late 1990s was called Nerve.com. It was, in theory, a smart online magazine about sex and culture. Did you ever run into Nerve.com back in the day? Yes. Yes, okay. definitely. Avid, avid Nerve.comers. Oh, great. Those were the days. Well, it was, I, I like to joke that Nerve was just smart enough to limit the audience size, but just sexy enough to scare away the advertisers. We, we, we just found, <laughs> we found the sweet spot. So our lead designer and tech guy, wonderful guy named Joey Cavella, named the server that we shared, M-I-A-S. So people were constantly saying, uh, yeah, you can find that in the ready to publish folder in my ass. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was a lot of there was a lot of lightness. Would this be inappropriate? No, I think it's highly appropriate to be referencing your ass at work. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's it's so dependent on the context, yeah. um, and it's also dependent on the intent, right? So. Uh, if we're analyzing any joke like that, where does it come from? Is it working to bring people together versus tear them right. apart? So all of those things are questions that you have to answer before you get into, okay, was this appropriate or not? Yeah, right, right, right. And uh, by the way, this is a, a common thing, especially that we see in tech companies mm-hmm, doing mm-hmm. that signals, hey, we're here to do serious work, but we're not here to take ourselves too seriously. So I remember at one point going to, I I can't remember if it was Facebook or Google, honestly, but seeing conference room names with titles like Toxicated so that you could say like, hey, we're going to meet Intoxicated this afternoon. (laughs) Um, yeah, Yeah. And so it's a way of just having these little cues that we're we're not going to take ourselves too seriously here, right? It's almost like speed bumps, you know, the, uh, the, uh, that stop people. I mean, the, you know, that just inject levity. I love it. Well, I, I've learned a lot of my kind of um, office decorum from uh, the television show The Office. I'm sure you. Uh, oh, that. perfect. <laughs> Attention, everyone. Hello. Uh, yes, I just want you to know that uh, this is not my decision. But from here on out, we can no longer be friends. And when we talk about things here, we must only discuss uh, work-associated things. And uh, you can consider this my retirement from comedy. And in the future, if I want to say something funny or witty or do an impression, I will no longer ever do any of those things. Does that include that's what she said? Mm-hmm. Yes. Wow, that is really hard. You really think you can go all day long? Well, you always left me satisfied and smiling, so... That's what she said! Oh, Michael! <laughs> Michael! <laughs> Michael, please. Serious. Please. 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 Please.
okay, one thing that's really interesting here, even though it's obviously such a heightened version of reality, right? You're probably not going to have a boss who acts that way. But it's actually illustrating a really important principle, which is when we rise in status in an organization, our calibration completely gets off. And there are research studies to support this, that if you have two people tell the same objectively lame joke, I think the joke that these researchers used was two muffins are baking in an oven. One of them turns to the the other and goes, it's hot in here. And the first muffin goes, oh my gosh, a talking muffin. (laughs) So this is clearly a really lame joke, right? Well, researchers have two conditions where they have an individual telling this joke. In one condition, they make participants believe that that person is of lower status than others in the room. Uh, And then in the other condition, they make individuals believe that that person is of higher status. In this case, they're the um, job interviewer. And so what they found is in the low status condition, where a low status person tells this joke, crickets, you get no laughter. And in the high status condition, everyone laughs. And so it's actually a problem for bosses, for senior people, that you have to get really good at recognizing what is someone's genuine laugh and what's their fake laugh. This was actually Seth Meyers. So Seth Meyers was a guest in the Mm -hmm. class. And when he was about to leave, we said, okay, you know, before you go, what's the single most important piece of advice that you have for our students? And he paused, he thought for a second, and he said, get really good at recognizing your own genuine laughter versus your fake laughter. Mm, Interesting. Because we all do it. We're all in situations where we want to impress someone or, you know, and we laugh just because we think it's the socially appropriate thing to do. If you get really good at recognizing that in yourself, you'll also be better at recognizing it in other people and therefore continuing to get feedback on how your humor is landing and if you might be crossing a line too. Interesting. That's such a good point. You have to also surround yourself with people who who give it to you straight. I'm very confident that I I, I don't get charitable laughter. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> given my three out of five status, it's just the the absence of laughter. Agree. Shows me the uh, uh, Shows me that they're telling the truth. Um, well, you, you write in the last chapter of the book. Once the workday is over, a workday you've infused with levity and humor, you go home to your full and beautiful and complicated life. What then? And uh, the answer, it seems, ideally, we imbue our days and nights with humor and levity, both both in the office. I mean, part of the mission here is to bring it into the office, but we also all need more of it uh, at home, too. That's right. I mean, you talked about your kids and your nearly perfect wife, who I'm sure is actually perfect. Very nearly perfect. Um, and Very that, nearly. That's right. But when you're generous with your laughter, especially with your kids, it brings about a sense of confidence that they are funny, that you see them, that you think they're funny, even if they're not, even if it's fart jokes. And (laughs) and what we find, at least anecdotally, is that when you bring humor to your life, especially among your family, that becomes, you know, a way of not just um, gluing the family together, but actually creating sticky memories. You know, we had this this study that we we love where when couples are asked to reminisce about shared moments of, mm. of laughter versus just happy moments, they report to be 23% happier in their relationship. You know, we spend all of this time in our life with counseling. And yet what we're showing is that the stories that you tell each other, or even the stories that you remember, have a remarkable impact on the social connection that you feel with important members of your family um, and your friends and more generally. And so to really look for those sparks of levity in these nooks and crannies of your everyday experience and look for invitations from your spouse and coworker and, you know, everyone around you, your kids. I, I love how you speak about the generosity of laughter and how, and how just being kind of available in the state of levity for shared humor and shared laughter is an act of generosity, I think is wonderful. Another thing that comes to mind is the way that um, I, I've often thought that much like day traders make money when the stock market's going down and when it's going up, if they're doing it well, artists can find joy and beauty in both the pain of life and the beauty of uh, upsides of life. You know, So it, it's this ability to, to take the, the pain and the challenges and the frustrations and convert them into shared joy, right? What could be better? 
Yes. So, you know, our, the book that we wanted to write was really one around hopefully transforming business that a, you know, humor is a superpower when that's completely under leveraged and underappreciated in work. But through the actual experience of writing the book, uh, we started to really understand the power of humor, not just as a secret weapon in life, but really to create meaning in life. And a lot of this work was kind of jump-started by my mom, actually, who has been a volunteer in hospice for the last 45 years. So we, as a family, I'm the oldest of three um, girls, would you know hear stories of what people regret in their last days of life, because that was her job, you know, is to, to listen and to think about how to make those last days meaningful. And I remember noticing and sharing with Naomi that one of the regrets that people mention is people say, I wish I had the chance to say, I love you one mm. more time. Mm. And in this afterword that Michael Lewis wrote with us, he has this wonderful quote, which is, when humor exists, love is not far behind. And so we find that there's few acts as easy and generous as, you know, sharing laughter with someone. And when you share laughter with someone, you make them feel valued. It's like a small little, small version of sharing love. I love that. That's so beautiful. I've, I've often thought that the reason to take photographs is to just look with greater appreciation. And the reason to write is to observe with greater attention and and this kind of levity mindset, as you say, it just makes you more consciously aware of all this, uh, all these opportunities for beautiful connection between humans. Navigate life on the precipice of a smile. What a beautiful message! And and I want to thank you guys because this has dramatically changed my week. As I said, I I, I want to tell you that my wife just yesterday at the end of the week upgraded my humor score to a three point five. <laughs> So, what? Yeah, yeah. She, she, <laughs> and we're giving you a 4.75. So uh, the average that. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for taking time out of your teaching and writing and stand up side hustles to make time for us today. Thank you so much for having us. I so enjoyed this conversation. So um, thank you. So did we. Oh, we loved it. Thank you so much, Rufus. And I, I think that was a three, a, what's it called? A three, a three part at the end there. Teaching, <laughs> writing, three, yeah. rule of three. Rule of three. Rule of three. Yeah. Look there at that. Go. Look at that. Would you like to hear two more big ideas from Humor Seriously? Download the Next Big Idea app and check out Jennifer and Naomi's book bite, which includes not three, but five big ideas. And why stop there? In your app, you'll also find 12 minute audio summaries of groundbreaking new books, Zoom discussions with your favorite authors and mind blowing e-courses. Search for Next Big Idea in your app store. Join us next week for a fascinating conversation with Ethan Cross, a psychologist who studies the voices in our heads. Special thanks to Jennifer Ocker and Naomi Bagdanis. Humor Seriously is available wherever books are sold, so you know bookstores. Our executive producers are Caleb Bissinger and Michael Kovnat. Theme music by Costa Galanopoulos. Sound design by Emma Erdbrink. I'm your host, Rufus Griscom. See you next week. How am I weird funny? That somehow you think shoving a stick of butter that's warm <laughs> with dirty sandals and clean underwear and shirts all would somehow work in a together. It was in a briefcase. No, this is how you pack in general. When we well, go when we go anywhere, it's a combination of dirty shoes on top of clean clothes, okay. on top of like a, a delicate manuscript, on top of some piece of food. Let the record show. All shoved together. Let the record show <laughs> that it was 10 years ago that no. I put a stick of butter no. in a briefcase no. with with socks and other random no. things. I am and I, our bags the problem all the time. was the problem was that we I forgot about our it. bags all the time. I'm going to unpack our bags tonight, and I am going to uncover this strange combination of things that Daddy likes to put in one single the bag. The problem was that we and didn't find some that, piece of food or sweetie, drink. We have, to, we have to complete the story. <laughs> okay. The problem is that we did not discover this stick of butter until like a month later. Do you remember that, Lisa? Yes, my mother discovered it. <laughs> <laughs>